And we fight pretty good, getting goals is our job And we get goals good, looking good, we are Carlisle United Hello everyone and welcome to the Brunton Bugle The number one place to get your Carlisle United fix in the podcast world I'm Lee Rooney And I'm Dan McLennan A brilliant win over the Pirates followed by a leggy defeat at Spotland While the Blues aren't mathematically safe, EFL football looks almost certain for another season We look back on those two games and look forward to this weekend's trip to the Wirral to face Tranmere Rovers Quite, quite a nice little uh, connection there, isn't it, Dan? To say we could be mathematically safe this weekend, maybe possibly, if we could do that. A Tramway mm. Rovers, obviously, home of Half Man Half Biscuit, who did a song called "Mathematically Safe." So there you go, mm. a little one for the uh, for the teenagers there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's a bit, bit of a mixed week, really, wasn't it, Dan? I mean, I think I think Tuesday night was basically a a knock on effect. One of game too far, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a bit one game too far. Definitely, definitely. That's, that's, that's the feeling you got. But sat last Saturday was was brilliant, wasn't it? Obviously, we'll get onto that in a minute. But yeah, fantastic stuff uh, to see. Um, come to the end of uh, March, pretty much a full month in charge now, or more than a full month in charge for Paul Simpson. Could have imagined he would have done as well as he he has done. Could you, Dan? You, I would have no, thought we would have been child. scrapping towards the end of the season, but here we are. A month later, we're pretty much safe. So. Brilliant to see. Um, let's go on to the news section then. Um, got a bit to fit in. Uh, I haven't actually put this in the news running order because it actually emerged this morning. But obviously, uh, good news for Morgan Feeney this morning, Dan. He was voted the uh, Football League World um, L- League Two Player of the Month, didn't wasn't he for for March for his performances? Obviously, that's one's based on a fan vote, and I think the club did a good job, didn't they? Getting everybody to yeah, vote for Morgan. And, uh... I think a lot of it is with those sort of votes is uh, your club and your local media sort of pushing it, and uh, it's something we're pretty good at. So, yeah, definitely. congratulations to him, well deserved. Absolutely, he's been he's been terrific this last month or so. I mean, the whole defence has really. I mean, Denell, John, even Mark Howard in Nettino has had some really big saves in games. So it's it's, it's really fantastic to see. Um, obviously, I think we'll probably have the the official EFL one nominations announced in the next few days. You'd think as well, wouldn't you, for the. Uh, Manager and player. I mean, Simpson's going to be up for the manager, of course. And based on the number of points gained over the month, no one can beat him, can they? So he he should win it, really. In theory, have to wait and mm. see, obviously. But um, in terms of, I mean, obviously they're going to put a player up as well because we've been the best team across the month. Other than Morgan, who else would you put up for it? I think Simu's probably up there. Possibly yeah. Patrick. Yeah. You can make a case for a few of them, to be fair. Yep. We've all been terrific, I think it's fair to say. Um, should we do the Lone Watch update again? And it's, it's pretty much the same story, isn't it? It's getting week? less each week. I was going to say, it's getting less each week, isn't it? Yeah, so... so basically, um, t- Taylor Charter players and the others don't. <laughs> yeah, don't you all. Taylor Charter plays. <laughs> Tristan gets a five-minute cameo and Manny just gets <laughs> yeah. to warm a bench somewhere, gets splinters yeah, in his backside. Put the oranges at half-time. <laughs> Yeah, um, as you mentioned there, Dan. Obviously, we'll start. In fact, let's let's cover the two that haven't done much first, as we did last week. Um, Tristan Abrahams. He's now up to twelve appearances, six of them as a sub and one goal. Not really a great return for a striker, that is it. Especially a team that's actually doing all right as well. It's not yeah. not, not great, really, is it? Um, uh, better result for the Mariners this weekend, though. They beat Dagenham Redbridge two one at Blundell Park to come to move back into the playoff places. Uh, only a brief appearance for Tristan, though. He came on off the bench. Uh, for the final five minutes of this game, um, like I said, he's playing his part. Let's just put it that way, shall we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas uh, Manny Manpala, as we mentioned already, didn't once again was the unused outfield sub for this game. I think they might have actually had two outfield subs after. I don't know they had a keeper on the bench for, the, yeah. for this match, but the Terriers lost three 0 at Torquay. That really result leaves them nine points um, adrift of safety with. Nine games to go. They've played a game more than fourth bottom old shot time as well. I mean, they look, they're dead and buried down there. They're going down by the looks of things. So Yeah, it would yeah. take a, a bit of a miracle. Yeah, I mean, incredible game in the National League last weekend, though, wasn't it? Uh, with our former player, Aaron Hayden, playing in it. Uh, Wrexham against Dover. What a ridiculous yeah, game for football that was. Those who missed it, Wrexham were two up. And Dover, who were by far the worst team in the National League, went 5-2 up. They were minus four points. It's incredible, yeah. isn't it? 
contrived to lose 6-5. I, I, I've watched the highlights of this and I feel so sorry for those Dover players because at the end, yeah, they look absolutely on their feet and you know they're all like on the knees, like seriously, this can't be happening. <laughs> look on their faces. But, yeah, uh, Just the way it goes. Aaron didn't actually score in that game, did he? Um, we might have an X-Files update. I don't know if he played for England Sea during the week, so you'll have to, we'll have to have a quick check of that as we're recording here. Um, Tell the Charles, and let's move on to him. He's now up to 14 appearances, three as a sub and two goals. Um, but Gator's winning run actually came to an end at the weekend as they were held nil-nil by Bradford Park Avenue um, at the International Stadium. Taylor played the full 90 minutes, once again starting at left back. Um, so, get a clean sheet. Decent result for him. Wasn't as big a blow as it could have been, though, was it, for, for Gator, Dan, for the Heat? Because um, their news rivals, Brackley Town, they drew at Spennymore Town. Um the big ones this weekend, though, isn't it? Huge game in National League North. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it Brackley at home? Brackley at home to Gateshead, yeah. So this yeah. is essentially a title decider, basically, because although Gateshead are three points ahead at the moment, Brackley have got a game in hand. Gateshead have got superior goal difference. So Brackley basically need to win this game to have a chance to put the title in their own hands, essentially, don't they? If they draw then it, it's still basically in Gateshead's hands because they know they can afford to lose one game and still be ahead of Gateshead. Uh, sorry, of Brackley. So, so yeah, huge, huge, huge game. Uh, interesting comments from Simmer, though, wasn't there, about um, Taylor as well in terms of whether he wanted to bring him back or not, wasn't there? Yeah, I think his, his uh, attitude was he's, he's playing full games, uh, let him play sort of thing, uh I don't know if he maybe would rethink that after Tuesday night, which we'll come on to later. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no. I, I'm, that's I'm his bit, decision. I'm a little bit more on the fence about this than I used to be. I was quite happy with him saying, let, let him stay there, get him playing his football. I'm getting close to the point now. I'm like, oh, well, actually, we could actually do an extra body in midfield there, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think maybe Kel- Kelvin Mellor getting back to fitness might stop that happening because obviously you can then move Joe Riley into midfield if you need to so yeah I think he might stay a bit longer but you know fantastic he's getting a good run of games good bit of experience I mean either way even if he doesn't get a new contract of us at the end of the season he's pretty much sorted himself and moved to Gateshead you'd think or at least probably another National League club as hopefully Gateshead will be next season Um, all right let's move on to the match review section then Dan um We'll cover them bit by bit, basically. We'll cover the Rushdale game second, because you didn't go to that one, and I did. So I can talk a bit more about that one. Um, so yeah, first up, Kai United 1, Bristol Rovers nil. Christian Dennis, two goals in two games for him. Um, yeah, over the week, it was two contrasting performances, wasn't it, really? I mean, the latter was definitely affected by the former, wasn't it? I think it's fair to say, in terms of what happened yeah, in the Rochdale yeah. game. I mean, against Rovers, United were... Full of energy, constantly pressing and harassing a, I'd say, a really good side. Uh, against a tidy but fairly toothless Rochdale side, they looked very leggy and sometimes struggled to keep up with play, actually, to be honest. It's uh, certainly not a disgraceful effort at Spotland. I mean, compared against some of the performances we've put in for away games, season where we've been beat, it really wasn't anywhere near as bad, to be fair. Um, and I think, to be honest, after the efforts at Brunton Park a few days Earlier, I, I, I've taken three points from those two games. It's probably not too bad of a return, I don't think. No, um, you know, it's one of them that the Bristol Rovers game would have been happy with a point, I think, given how well they've played. Um, and to be honest, Rochdale, you would probably have been happy with a point away from home, sort of thing. Yeah. So to get three points out of the two games, yeah, you can't complain. The key thing is it puts us on course for EFL football next season. That's the that's the main aim, really, isn't yeah. it? And as lovely as it would be to try and push for a top half finish, you know what? If we finish twentieth now or twenty first, twenty second, you'd still be happy, wouldn't you? Because we're like, well, we're safe. Yeah. We're playing EFL football. We can work towards next season. Uh, well, let's talk about the Bristol Rovers game then, Dan. Uh, first up, the goal. Let's go straight to it. Um, you you'd probably describe it as a bit of a tap in slash instinctive finish. Well, maybe not tapping to a bit harsh, but you know, it was just an instinctive close range finish from Dennis. But I think all the elements together made this a really, really good goal, didn't it? 
yeah, everything that worked. Yeah, out. it was a, a proper a proper porch's finish, wasn't it? You know, it was very Stevens-esque. something we've lacked. Yes, it's something you, we've uh, lacked for a while. I think you want to sing his praises in a minute when we've uh, finished discussing this, really. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, first up, full credit to John Mellish actually on the throw. It's something that maybe gets a little bit lost in this because. Often you get a throw in there and your first instinct is to launch it down the line and hope to win the header or gain a bit of ground. But he was really aware, wasn't he? He picked the ball up and yeah, yeah. he spots Gibson in acres of space in the middle. I don't know why we don't do this more often. Get the ball into the middle and, and so someone like Gibson who's got such good close control and such a good passer of the ball. Plays it to him. He plays a nice little ball over the top for Patrick. I mean, it was a difficult one. The defender did actually quite well, didn't he, at first? To sort of shadow him out towards the corner flag. Yeah, yeah. He, he did the right thing, pushing him out, didn't yeah. he? You know? Unfortunately, he got caught by the, uh, the Patrick <laughs> flip-flap, didn't he? Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Because when it happened at the time... Pushing past. When he did it at the time, my first thought was, oh, he's took that out of play. And when the lines were the flag, I was like, oh, well, why should that, surely that's a goal kick. All right, play on. Um, did brilliantly got to the byline did the right thing playing an aggressive pass into Gibson and I've got to say what a first touch from Gibson actually another thing that gets a little bit lost in this to be able to basically sell the defender send the defender for a hot dog and take that little touch to, to kill it dead and then he was unlucky basically the defender did really well to block the shot but Dennis was there just lurking quickly reacted after a bit of close control and hammers it in the back of the net I mean, I mean there was a suggestion I think that they were trying to claim handball, uh, offside for it, but I think what they were claiming was a handball, weren't they? But actually, when you watch yeah, the replay from behind the goal, it's not a handball at all. He, he hits his chest no, and no. he's just quick to react and fight into the back of the net. Um, great goal, really, wasn't it? Just, just I mean, the, the, the noise yeah. when it went in as well was, was fantastic. I've got to say as well, another good crowd as well. Really, really lifted yeah. since we've come back. Good, uh, good away following as well. I think you've got to go yeah. tip your hat to Bristol Rovers bringing 600 odd. There's, yeah. there's not many teams usually bring more to us than we take to them. So Yeah, and a long, long journey as well, really, when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, come yeah. Come that far. Um, yeah, terrific, terrific effort by them. But to have, what, 5,200 fans for a Saturday home game? We've not had that for a long time, to be fair. I'll take away, the, obviously, no, the, no. the big crowd for the the game against Northampton. But that, that really shows what Sim, some a good character like Simpson, someone the fans like and... Appreciate can really it bring, boards it? well for Easter Monday, which is the next home game now, isn't it? And you'd imagine Mansfield could potentially bring up to four figures for that, couldn't they? They're really gunning for promotion. You'd expect them to bring a decent crowd up for this. You know, this is one of those games they really need to push them for a top three place at the moment. I know they're generally they're not that well supported in that sense, but when you get to sort of the business end of a season, teams like that do sometimes on a bank f- holiday. You know, it's... yeah, find those extra fans to come. So you'd expect it. Um, some of the talking points from this game, Dan, would, I put that in, I, 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 I think there's a strong argument for this. Best win in Simo's run so far? Uh, probably, yeah. I think uh, the Northampton game's probably its main rival. Um, you could probably shout for Oldham as well, but that was more just the circumstance, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, the last minute. But uh, no... Uh, the, the three teams we've had up here recently and who, who were at the business end, uh, we all thought Newport were better than Northampton and I think Bristol Rovers were better than both. I think yeah. that's a fair comment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I genuinely think Bristol Rovers are one of the best sides bar Forest Green this season that I've seen, I would say. Yeah, yeah. They were, uh, they were, they were good, you know. And I know in the, the season preview, we I, I suggested the struggle, which... Up until Christmas, they did, you know, but uh, fair, fair play to Joy Barton. He's got them going, and uh, I'd, I'd be very surprised if they're not banging the mix at the end, you know. I mean, Elliot Anderson, they signed from Newcastle United, he seems to be the catalyst, doesn't he, for making them better. And he was the big threat in this game, wasn't he? Constantly cutting in, backing onto his right foot from the left wing, and he, he was a big threat. But actually, fair play, Simeo dealt with him really well, I felt, in this game. Yeah, Anderson, I thought we did a good job on him. You know, he's, mm. he's clearly too good for League Two. Uh, there's a lot of scouts watching him, by all accounts. Uh, Newcastle have had someone over. His parent club, uh, talk of championship-level teams wanting him. Well, so Ryan Lowe you know, was in the stands I, I, watching the game, wasn't he, I think? Preston manager. So. Yeah, uh, apparently he left with Barton, and obviously good, good friends. Uh, 
But no, I, I thought I thought uh, Samir did a good job on him. You know, so you know he was he was neutralised pretty much for me. I, I, I feel Simeon, we're, we're gonna we're gonna struggle to keep him next season, aren't we? I think I think he's yeah, I don't think he's tackled. But it's, now, it's, now he's settled into proper football. It, it's fantastic to see how much he's really got behind being at the club, isn't it? Really, because I mean, you see some lone players who just couldn't give a toss, could they? And they're they're, they're just here maybe to get a few appearances under the belt. And, and yeah, and, he was at uh, he, he tweeted that last night. He'd been to Wigton to Nelson yeah. Tomlinson for. To mm. hand out awards, you know, that's something that the club try and do with players, and uh, you know, he obviously enjoyed it, and you know, kids will make a fuss over him because yeah. we're playing well as well, you know, so it works but, both ways. Because there's been some talk, hasn't there? I think over the last year or two that players have been slacking a little bit in that area in terms of doing that sort of yeah. thing. They've not been when Danny Granger was here and captain players knew they had to go and do stuff like that, didn't they? Really, they, they would really yeah. stand down, and it just seems to have fallen a little bit on the wayside. I know Simo said he's not got involved in that side of things, really, but you would imagine there's at least a little bit of influence there. It's like, if, if you're not going to these things, you might not get selected yeah. for my team, sort of that sort of hint yeah. to those players, isn't it, I think. But but yeah, he he was immense again, and like I said, just great to see his passion as well when, when the goal... I mean, that, he had one moment, didn't he, when he brought the ball out of defence, he, he won it an inception brilliantly. Charged forward, played it to Patrick. Patrick ran a look, and then... Next thing you know, he's overlapping him on the left wing. <laughs> I think Patrick <laughs> had to have a word with him and say, all right, calm down, leave me to do this. Thanks very much. But yeah, yeah. great to see him getting involved in that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, like, like, like we were saying there just before, I, I think Bristol Rovers are probably you know, destined for promotion. At, at the very least, I think they'll be in the playoffs. There's no way I, I can see them missing out on that, really. Um, but yeah, the, full credit to them, a side that played decent football and, and, and caused us problems. Yeah. Um, Go on then. Let's talk about Christian Dennis because I know you're 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 already a big fan of his, aren't you? How how good do you think yeah. he's been in recent games? Uh, I think he's got just just reward for all his efforts in uh, those the battle and the uh, Bristol Rovers game. You know he's he's done a hell. Of, he's a very very selfless player. You know mm. he's the work he does for the team, especially running the lines. And you know there's times he'll make runs and there's no chance it's going to him, but. He's dragging the defender with him, so it does help, you know. And it, his work rate's just, you know, I'd, I'd like to see his running stats. You know, I think I think they'd be uh, ne- nearly up with the road runner John Mellish, you know. But, uh... Steady, steady. <laughs> but, um, but no, <laughs> but no he's, 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 I mean, what, what, he was a bit of an, uh, he was a bit of a curveball signing when he came in, wasn't he? You know, and I don't think a lot of people, a lot of people looked at his St. Mirren record and thought, well. He hasn't scored many up there. He's, he's maybe on the way out, and I think his his performances over the last month have proven that he definitely isn't. And uh, you know, he's he could play a really good part next season as well. You know, I think getting a good preseason behind him this summer would be he could really yeah, come out of yeah. guns blazing, couldn't he? Yeah, because like I said, he's got that natural instinct. He's a he's a finisher, isn't he? He just has little snapshots and things like that. One of the best moments is on on the you know the, the club would do that pitch side blues thing on YouTube now, which I'd say is really really good. You get such a good angle of of things and how they work. And th- there was one clip I remember that chance down where um, I think it sort of he was sort of headed forward and the defender sort of waited to let it go back to the keeper, and Dennis just snuck in from nowhere and slid in a chance, and then an armor slid in on the rebound and got booked for a, a late challenge on the keeper. Yeah. But if you watch it. It comes from absolutely nowhere, and he's basically just having the awareness and movement to know right that ball's going to he- get headed back there. That defender's going to leave it. I can potentially sneak in here and get a goal. And yeah, we haven't had a player yeah. like that for so long, have we? Really? Like you said, I mean, I'm not saying we've, we've probably had players like that since, but he is so reminiscent of Ian Stevens, a player who probably, when you on reflection now, you look back, he was a really hard worker, just not you yeah, know not in the way of like he was. Plays. <laughs> he's not he's just not full blooded was he he was basically just a just a workhorse who, and he could hold the ball up really well and you can see that with Dennis too um, yeah he was fantastic um, Amari Patrick I, I actually thought he didn't have that great a game no uh, the young lad at the back for Bristol Rovers did a really good job on yeah. him most of Taylor the was it I think yeah yeah I think he's only about 20 years old yeah but uh, he, he, he looks a good player, that Taylor, and he, he clearly done his homework on Patrick, you know. But uh, but it shows the importance of keeping know. him on, doesn't it? Because he, he can have that one little moment of magic that just opens up yeah, the defence. Yeah. 
and create a chance. And that's what he did, Ray, basically. And after that point, actually, he looked really good. He, that gave him a little bit of confidence and, he, and, he, and his game definitely stepped up. Um, good to see Kelvin Miller back in the team as well for the last few minutes. Obviously, players were <laughs> struggling the last 10 minutes or so, weren't they? They were falling like flies, but he came on for Joe Riley. And, he, you know, obviously, it's only a 10-minute or so cameo, but he looked decent, didn't he? It did, and it also gives us much-needed options for this week. Uh, you know, he's, he's a natural right-sided mm. defender. Joe Riley's been excellent there, but we could probably do with him in the middle at the moment. So yeah. Obviously, we'll, we'll touch on this more later on, but yeah, yeah. You know, no, good to see him back. Yeah, I think it probably deserves a bit of credit to that midfield, though, because you consider that midfield that started against a very good Bristol Rovers side, the midfield three... None of them are centre midfielders. You've got two yeah, wingers, yeah. or wing back in, in Dickinson's case, and Gibson, and then you've basically got a central defender who's sort of filling in there at the moment in, in Corey yeah, yeah. And they all play brilliantly. Can't, couldn't fault them in, this, in the performance in this game. The Rochdale game, we'll touch on in a sec. <laughs> a little bit mm. different in that one, but yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, before we get on to the Rochdale game, let's give a shout out to the ball boys, shall we? Yeah, terrific shithouse behaviour by some of them R- really nice to see you see this away from home all the time nice to finally see us catching on and actually doing it I know some people don't like it but you know what it's part of the game So I was a ball yeah. boy in the, at the end of the 80s early 90s mm. and I always remember Dave McKellar coming to tell us in the drying room that we used to all wait in telling us what to do if we were winning because we didn't win, win that much back then <laughs> you know he'd be like lads lads Winning a couple of minutes ago, take your time, take your time, <laughs> you know. But I mean, it, it, it's interesting. To see. Yeah, much was made of it after the game. I mean, Barton mentioned it a couple of times. Their commentators, actually, because I listened back to a bit of the, or rewatched a bit of the game, sorry, on the um, iFollow uh, service, because you can actually listen back with either the Radio Cumbria commentary or the away commentary. And they were quite complimentary about us, but they, they, they made a bit more about the their behaviour a little than it actually really was. I mean, one yeah. of, I mean, the best example was the one where, where the lads. Basically, the ball went over into the water from the lad. Rather than throw it back, walked along to to basically go and place it, <laughs> and, and their player got a bit annoyed, took it off him, gave him a little bit of a shove, which you know unnecessary really. But the other ones that were mentioned, they made a big one about the uh, the issue. I think it was down in the um, uh, waterworks east stand end corner flag area. Ball goes out for a throw in. I think we were making a sub or something like that, so it wasn't any rush. But Dennis got the ball off. The, the ball boy gave the ball straight to Dennis. Not didn't do it slowly. And then Dennis was getting some stick from some fat lad sat in the front of the uh, Bristol Rovers end. And Dennis just chucked the ball to him and said, go on, you have it for a bit then if you're not bothered. <laughs> no, he wasn't going to take it. The guy got really angry and then the guy launched the ball in the ball boy's face. And the ball boy had done nothing wrong. <laughs> there was no yeah. need to do it. And, it, and the commentator was making out like he'd done a bad thing. It, it, was just, it was just silly, really. There was nothing in it. And, and there was another one actually where their player went and recovered the ball from in the waterworks and dropped it down. The ball boy picked it up and went to go and throw it over and he got really angry because he wasn't doing it quickly and was like, well, if you're that bothered, why didn't you throw it yourself in the first place? <laughs> it's, it's it's the logic sometimes of footballers. You can't get it. But, but yeah, n- nice to see a bit of um, smart behaviour from our players really, wasn't it, on this occasion? Yeah, so, definitely. So there you go. Um, right, well, let's move on then to the Rochdale game. Um, yeah, 2-0 to Rochdale. Oh, no. Not a huge amount more you can say of that really. It was It was quite a bit closer game than a 2-0 actually. I think 1-0 probably would have been a fairer scoreline. Both I, teams I, had... think, I think it was I think it was one of those classics where they went 1-0 early. We came into it as it went on and then we've been caught as we try yeah. to equalise, you yeah. know, and it happens, you know, it's Chalk it down, you know. Yeah, just, just like I said, just a game too far. That's that's all it really was, really. Um I'll talk about the through the goals. Um First up uh, was the Liam Kelly penalty. Um, it's a soft one to give away, really, I think. Um, you, you'll have seen the highlights by now, Dan, I presume. Um, yeah. Just summed up how tired the players looked, really, for most of the game. Dooley has a run down the left-hand side of the 18-yard box. Gets just inside, and, and Whelan just sort of lunges in a bit. And when you look back at it, he doesn't really need to. If he's going to think of crossing, the defenders or Howard can probably deal with it from that position. It's not going to be that threatening, but for some reason, Whelan just sort of swings a leg at it. And it's hard to tell on the on the cameras. It's a bit of a theatrical dive, but it probably looks like he does. He does go easily. I think he goes easily. 
But I think he's clipped but, his heels. I don't think there's a huge yeah. amount. I mean, there wasn't a massive amount of argument from our players about the decision, to be honest. So yeah. that's usually quite telling. Um, Kelly steps up and, and Howard actually goes the right way and he's not that far off saving it. He, he it, wasn't far off it, was he? No, but it was very well struck, to be fair. And, and yeah, uh, yeah. made it 1-0. I was quite impressed with Kelly, actually. He's a tidy little player, but it's one of those ones where I looked at him and thought, he's really good on the ball, and he? He's got plenty of space in this game. If you've got Guy and Devitt starting this game, he's not getting anywhere near as much time or space on that ball. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's where the big difference was really in midfield. We didn't have players that could do that in the same way that we, we normally would. Uh, second goal was, um, I think it was Connor Grant, wasn't it? I think, um, again, just a sign of tiredness in the team and it was just a little bit too easy for them. All, I mean, it, albeit a very good finish though, to be fair, smashing it in off the bar from the angle. Um, it looked more dramatic, didn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly did. Well, it bounces up, hits the ground, and hit the bar again, didn't it? Because at first I thought, yeah. oh, it's hit the bar and it's come out. But actually, it, it obviously just went into the back of the net. Um, just before this, we just made a little switch around, actually, because Armour had just come off, hadn't he, for um, Amatoya. So Dickinson had gone to left wing back. And actually, there was a point where Dickinson went to go and take a throw in down the line. And their lad basically grabbed him and stopped him. But instead of actually just trying to take the throw in and obviously failing because the lad had grabbed him and getting the lad booked, Dickinson just stopped and the ref didn't do anything about it. it, it, it I'll get onto the ref in a minute because he, he was weak. He was very poor. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of head tennis. Um, Dickinson sort of gets caught in no man's land. Ball comes to O'Keefe and he slots it into um, Grant. I think Mellish was a bit tired by this point. He just sort of caught, caught a little bit out of position. Not massively, but a little bit. Um, Grant's into the area and just smashes it in off the bar and it's 2-0 at that point it was it was game over and you could see the players like well just chalk this one off let's not concede another let's just try and maybe nick one on the break if we can but no, let's not do anything silly so yeah just one of those days really wasn't it um, in terms of talking points I, I, I said to you before Dan I've said this a few times just a game too far basically um, after the efforts against Bristol Rovers Probably not not a massive surprise. I have to say, I was quite surprised actually when we we went to the uh, the Wilbutts Lane uh, chippy for the game. As did quite a few people. It was a hell of a queue there to get in uh, to get this ground before the match. Um, the discussion on the Carla fans basically was surprised he's not made any changes. I was a bit shocked about that. Yeah, uh, the the one that stood out for me, given his glaring miss, was Jack Armour because prior to Barrow, he hadn't been a hundred percent. Uh, he had a, a bit of a bug and then he'd obviously had a hard game Saturday and with having uh, Roberts available mm. you know there's there's a like for like waiting there you know yeah. it's there was maybe you know I would maybe have changed armour you could maybe have made a case for Mella starting but mm. you know maybe a bit early but I think it's something that Simpson sort of acknowledged post match as well yeah. wasn't it yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll touch about his post-match interview in a minute, actually. Um, but yeah, as you, actually, as you mentioned there, to be fair, Dan, we still actually did have chances. <laughs> it wasn't like it was a game where we... The stats, actually, looking at... I'm just looking at the stats here. They're pretty equal, aren't they? 50% possession each. They had eight shots, uh, of which two were on target. We had six, which, of which two were on target. We had a lot more corners. Um, fouls are fairly equal. It was a very balanced game. Um, I've got a point on corners, actually, in a minute that really wound me up a little bit. Um, but yeah, we still had a chance at that armour one. He just got his technique horribly wrong. I don't know why he's trying to side yeah. it from there. Just put your laces through the ball. And if the keeper saves it, well, Dennis might be able to get up in time to, to get the rebound in, possibly. It's it's one of those ones you look and you think, oh, that's a tired player, that. Because I'd, I'd like to think a, a fresh Jack Armour would, would probably put his laces through that and, and get an equaliser at that point. We could well go go on to win the game from that. It really gives us a bit of a lift and knocks their confidence a little bit. You, you had a point you wanted to mention about Jack Armour, didn't you, actually? I think we, we were discussing this during the week. Yeah, uh, we, we were just chatting and uh, we've got our Google WhatsApp. Uh, I think folk forget how young Jack Armour is. Hmm. You know, he's, he's only a second-year pro, same as Taylor Charters, actually. Yeah. Um, he's so he'll be what twenty year old, I think. Yeah, I think he's I'm just checking. I'm just coming up yeah, to he's 21. twenty one. Just twenty twenty one. Yeah, so he's he'll be a third year pro actually. But um, you know, he's I think we counted it up, and he's he's played about seventy games, which you know it's it's, it's a lot for a young lad. Uh, he's mm. played twice as many as Charters, 
who was a similar sort of age. And most of the and charters, a lot of have, been charters have been a, a lot have been off the bench, haven't they? Mm, you know, yeah. whereas you know, but uh, yeah, I, I think you know, it's, he, he does look tired. He's he's had a long season. You know, he's he's played nearly every game. You know, thirty six league league games this yeah. year, and he's, he's played chuck, a lot of chuck the chuck the cups in. It's yeah. forty three. You know. And he's played a lot of games at left wing back as well, which is a different position to being a left back. You're getting up and down the pitch yeah, so much yeah, more, aren't yeah. you? So it's it, yeah. it's been quite a challenge, I think, for him. And, and hopefully he'll benefit I mean, from I, that next season. I, I I still think he'll become a left sided centre back in time mm. because he's because of his height, you know. But yeah, uh, no, I think uh, I think he's just maybe needs that one game rest just to recharge his batteries. And, yeah, because uh, obviously he did that for the Newport game, didn't he, Simo? And it didn't quite work out. Hence why he brought him back in. But I yeah, mean, I yeah. Think maybe, well, I, I think know. some. Of, I think some of that was to do also with the loss of Mellish late on, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So that that was probably why Roberts struggled a little bit in that game because he didn't have Mellish. Yeah, yeah. And McDonald had only just come back in. So. You know, you ended up changing the entire left hand <clears throat> side of your yeah of your defence that yeah. game, but. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Armour did struggle in this game. First half especially. He actually got better second half and I thought he was actually doing okay up until he got subbed. There's maybe a bit unlucky in that sense. I think Dickinson was getting a lot of stick from some of our fans and I thought actually Dickinson, me, me and John McGee were talking about this, we felt Dickinson was one of our better players for most of this game. Yeah, nothing, not everything comes off and you know he doesn't win every single tackle but he was working hard. He was getting up and down the pitch and he was the one player who was trying to be positive with the ball as well actually. Patrick again was a little bit infuriated in this game. He he was getting into good position. He, he got a bit bullied when he was playing in the centre by Dorset, who had a really good game for them at centre back. But then he got into the positions on the wing a few times, and he had the ball in a bit of time and space. And he took his time. And he took a touch and he went back as if he's thinking, oh, "Maybe I can take him on and get to the byline here." And I looked and I thought, "Just whip a ball into the box." Yeah, there might not be someone there, but if you do it two or three times, suddenly the players click on. Ah, he's going to be doing that every time he gets onto the ball. There now, I'll get into the box next time he's in that position, and I can get on the end of it. That's the way you, that, he did it. He did it once with about two or three minutes to go. And he whipped a, a really good ball from a tight position on the right into the box. And I thought, why is he not doing that more often? Why is he not getting that ball into the box? That, just a little bit infuriating, things like that. But that's, you know, I know he's not that young. He's, what, 25, Patrick. But he's still learning very much, isn't he? Because he's come up through non-league football. It's a bit different, isn't it? Uh, when you've, you've come up through that way. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, and in this game, I know we, we we praised him for his performance against Bristol Rovers, but Corey Whelan didn't have a great game in this match. It's fair to no. say he looked not even just the penalty. There was there was a couple of times where he was so slow on the ball in the middle. I just don't think he's quick enough to do, be that role of a midfielder. He's okay for maybe one or two games max, but beyond that, if you get a midfielder that's quick and harries around him, he panics and he takes too long on the ball. Instead of just getting the ball and getting rid of it quickly as a good midfielder in that position would do. Someone like Callum Guy doesn't really dawdle on the ball that much. He generally gets rid of it fairly quickly. He, get, he, he spreads out wide. Whelan's just a little bit slower. You can get away with it at centre-back because you've not got much behind you, really. But when you're playing there as a mid- midfielder, you've got to be aware of everything that's going around. I think um, Lummy's talked about this before, hasn't he, with uh, John Mellish, I think, and the fact that you know he found it a bit tough in midfield because he's got to be aware of everything that's around him rather than what's in front of him when he's in defence. So... So yeah, not not a great game for Corey. I'd, I'd imagine there's a good chance Danny Devine will probably start against Tramway. He did all right when he came on. Again, he's one that infuriates me though because so often he doesn't he doesn't play the pass. He does the difficult bit. He picks up the ball and he goes in a little charge and run, and then he doesn't play the pass early enough and he gets tackled. That's something he needs to learn. Whether he's with us next season, I suspect probably not because he's not really played that much. But but yeah, another one who's a bit 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 frustrated. Um. Should we talk about Paul Simpson's post-match interview? Yeah. I, I, I thought this was really refreshing, actually, because... Yeah, it was, it was. We've had some absolute BS from managers down the years. I mean, last couple of years, especially in post-match interviews. I mean, some of Beach's ones were... I know some fans really like them. I just found them... Uh, nauseating is probably the, the wrong word, but yeah. I just did not enjoy them at all because he, he was the same cliché stuff every time and... We always heard this, you know, under curl, obviously, his favourite phrase, earn the right to play or, or whatever and getting on the bus and, and crap like that. Simpson just basically said after this game, I probably made a mistake there. I probably should have changed the team. I probably should have given players rest. But I felt, you know, they you know, they deserve to have another go because they've done so well against Bristol Rovers. But, you know, it, it shows that even at his age, he's still learning stuff about this team, isn't he, really? So, 
No fair play to him. He, he basically didn't go all in on the plays. He said we didn't start well enough, but you know that's just the way it is, isn't it? So just nice to hear that from a manager. Be honest and say, yeah, I made a mistake. Yeah, um, you know, it's as you said, it's you know the the refreshingness of it. You know, I mean, mm. there's, there's managers we've had in recent years would have come out with all kinds of slather, yeah. but no, he's, he's basically held his hand up and said. You know, game too far, maybe should have made some changes, you know. Take it on the chin and go again, you know. Yeah, it's interesting some of his, uh, not just his post match interview this week, but some of his comments when he's doing interviews now. More and more, it sounds closer and closer like he's happy, he's happy with the idea of staying, doesn't it? It's just, it's not a massive change, but every single interview, there's just a little bit more, isn't there? Hints like, you know, we're having little discussions, we're having to think this and that and this and that. And he, he's still sticking to his argument, decide at the end of the season, but... I think once we're mathematically safe, I think that I reckon that'll ramp up a little bit, don't you? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, people are, you know, there's a little change in what's being said. Maybe he's getting a little bit closer to saying he's happy to stay. There's, mm. you know, there's whispers of things in the background. If, if everything lines up right, you never know. Yeah, you, you spotted an inter- oh, a few of us spotted an interview you did in the the Athletic, didn't he, the other day? And he mentioned stuff about takeovers there. Uh, that might just be sort of general throwaway comment that might he, but he sort of seemed to hint as well, maybe that. Yeah, it stuff was, was sort of like you know, it, it was probably the most concrete mention we've seen, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, and for it to come from someone so prominent, mm. you know, maybe, maybe putting two and two together and getting four and a half, but yeah. uh, you know. Seems to be hinted at, doesn't it? Um, well, yeah, I think basically good to see another 500 away support. One of those games, like I said, but you just take it on the chin. Rochdale aren't actually that bad aside. With a decent striker in there, I could see them actually challenging for the playoffs next season. I think they've got a really tidy yeah, little, yeah. little team there. Uh, I've actually... Well, 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 it depends if you end up with a point. Well, yes, you know com- completely forgot about that, actually. It's funny, they, they were doing collections outside to help them uh, stave off the hostile taker. I said the Carlisle ones have been very generous, actually, giving a lot of money towards that, so really good to see. Um, yeah, to be honest, we haven't really got time to talk about how bad the referee was, just, but just take it from me, he was dreadful. He completely lost control of the game. He was, just didn't really have a grip on it from the start, to be honest. And from what a few people were saying... Simi was probably lucky to get a booking for that tackle he had early on. So, uh, again, it may be a little bit in our favour in one sense, but but there you go. So, yeah, I think we're both agreeing, aren't we? Three points from the two games is a decent return. Dust ourselves off and uh, go again this week against Tranmere. And uh, we'll preview that game in just a second. This is John Mellish. You listen to the Brunton Bugle. And we're back for part two of this week's Brunton Bugle. We're going to be previewing the Tramway Rovers game in just a sec. Just a reminder, you can subscribe to the podcast and uh, via any good podcast app. So, you know, Acast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast. We're on all of those. Um, and if you do subscribe, please also, if you can on the app or anywhere on the, the website, uh, give us a, a quick uh, review. Five stars would be lovely. I, mean, I think the vast majority of the ones we've got are five stars. Very, very generous of you to do that. Um, we're also on social media. Follow us at Brunton Bugle. Uh, on Twitter, search for the Brunton Bugle on Facebook and click like, and you'll get posts when we update them. Um, we're also on the Be Just and Fear Not Facebook group and the Cumbrians.net message board, as well as via I'm, email. I've just sent, I've just sent a tweet as we're recording. Ah, very good stuff. Via uh, email, you can contact us uh, Brunton Bugle at gmail dot com. Just a reminder as well, uh, this season the. Second half of the show has been sponsored by the Cal United Sports Club London Branch. The London Branch is open to all Cal United fans. They've got members from Cornwall to Dundee and Houston to Singapore, and of course, every part of London and the South East. They regularly meet up on away trips as well as arranging many social events, sports games, and fundraising for the club. They'll be providing us with information for the away games as part of the preview section this season too. You can find out more about London Branch at their website, carlislelondonbranch.org. The recommended pub for this week's game is actually the uh, the fan park down at the ground. A bit more on that in a minute. Um, and also, if you just fancy a pub, the, the Mersey Clipper or the Prenton Park right by the ground are perfect places to go to. But yeah, uh, before we get on to talking about the game, um, as usual, it's the Behind Enemy Line section that starts the second half of the show. Uh, this week we spoke to Paul from the This Is Tranmere podcast. Um, had a really good chat with Paul. Um, we had a chat about what has happened to that defence that was impressing so much, what, so much in the first half of the season. 
Um, it's just gone to pieces, really. Uh, are the fans mm. still behind Mickey Mellon in his first season back at Prenton Park uh, after that drop-off in form? And can they still get promoted this season? As well as a little bit about what, what United fans can expect at Prenton Park, because I think we talked about it a bit, but they've got a brilliant fan zone there down at the club, and they're actually working on a permanent fix, uh, structure there as well to go with it. So uh, a little bit about that. Here's the chat I had with Paul earlier this week. Paul, I think it's fair to say it's been a, a real up and down season so far for Tranmere Rovers, hasn't it? I mean, you had a brilliant defensive record at the start. You got yourself into a playoff position. Then you sort of dropped off a little bit. Then you seem to have spent an absolute age in second place. But over the last four or five games, you've really dropped off again. And now you're in danger of missing out on the playoffs. Why has it been so difficult to find consistency across the season? That's a, that's a good question, Lee, to be fair. Um, if I knew the answer, I uh, probably wouldn't be sat here talking to you. Um <laughs> Definitely be sending Mickey a, a text to uh, to get him to sort it out, but uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a it's been a I was going to say up and down, but it's been it's been um, been a roller coaster really. Um, started off where we couldn't score a goal for love the money, um, but we like as you said, we had that strong defensive record which um, you know kept, kept us in games and was was picking us up the odd the odd points. I think we went eight first eight games, something like four, five goals, four and against in those eight matches, which uh, <laughs> doesn't make for great watching uh, when you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, I, I, the the honest answer, mate, is I, I haven't got a clue. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've got a good group of players there who should be performing um, on a consistent basis. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, they always blowing, blowing ever either quite hot or incredibly cold. And at the minute, it's uh, very, very cold. Um, just don't know. You know, goals are uh, not looking like they the 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 flowing. Um, the defensive side of the game is is not as strong as it as it has been. Um, so yeah, and uh, I mean the, the 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 pieces of the jigsaw are exactly the same, pretty much. Mm. But um, yeah, it's just, it's all been muddled up in the box, to be fair. So you mentioned about the issues with uh, scoring goals; it has been a real problem for you this season. I think only is it maybe Hartlepool have got a poorer goal scoring record in the top half. I think something like that. I think yeah. so. Forty four goals over the games. So it's, it's you know barely over one a game. It obviously is going to make it more of a challenge, isn't it? I mean. You look to sort of rectify that in January because you brought in, uh, was it Kane Hemmings, I think, wasn't it, from uh, Burn Albion? Yeah. He seems to be quite a good addition, but how's he settled in so far? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's come in, he's had a, I think he's got two or three goals um, so far. Um, to be to be fair to him, he doesn't get that, that many chances, which is the main yeah. problem, I think. Um it's the creating of the chances. It's not so much the uh, putting the ball in the back of the net. It's actually you know, creating opportunities to <laughs> to do it in the first place. Um, yeah, you know he's he's come in. He's 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 done okay. Um, he works hard. He he runs the channels. He's a bit a bit. We've compared him a little bit to uh, to James Norwood, not wanting to put you know, too much pressure on him. Um, but yeah, that, that that type of player is running the channels, leading the line. But uh, yeah, you know, we're looking for somebody alongside him really to uh, to to play off, um, and, and bag the goals as well. And um, yeah, we've, we've had a few injuries in in fairness in those positions. Um, we've got Elliot Nevitt, we've had Charlie Jolly, we've had a couple of others. Uh, Glatzel, on loan from Liverpool, has come in and got injured. So yeah, we've had a you know a, a variety of, of partnerships up front, which as of yet haven't really clicked and haven't really helped him in terms of uh, settling in and, and getting you know his feet under the uh, under the under the table and scoring goals. Yeah, the, the interest you mentioned Norwood there, you've not really ever replaced him, have you really, since he went, really? It's been quite right. difficult to, to find a goal scorer who scores as many goals as he did. Um, let's talk about the manager there, Mickey Mellon. Uh, how do you think he's done in his first season back at Prenton Park? Again, very mixed. Um, I know on Saturday, uh, I wasn't at the game, actually, on, on away at, at Colchester. But um, there was a lot of talk on Twitter afterwards about, 
you know, a lot of debate about whether he should be, he should still be here, um, whether mm. he should maybe leave at the end of the season, stuff like that. I'm totally behind him. Uh, I think he's 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 doing okay. Obviously, at the moment, the you know, results and performances aren't 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 good enough. Um, but I do think he is the man for the job. I do think he can uh, he can turn things around. He's he's done it before, not just at, at Tranmere, and obviously we've we've enjoyed back to back promotions under him. But you know he's won promotions at other clubs, uh, you know, through his his managerial career and while well, while he was a player as well. So he's he's uh, he's got my support, but um, yeah, there are there are murmurs among the uh, the Tranmere faithful that uh, you know that he's he's not getting his tactics right. He's not. Picking the right team, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as you get from supporters up and down the country, really. But I do still believe that he is the man to take us forward and uh, hopefully get us at least into the playoffs at the uh, the end of the season. Hmm. Um, so let's, let's talk about that defensive record. Then let's talk specifically <laughs> about one of those defenders in there, uh, Mister Peter Clark, still going strong at forty years old. And I think at one point in the start of the season, he was your top scorer and free goals and playing that, wasn't he? <laughs> um, how does he keep going? Because he, I mean, I don't know if he still got it, but didn't he have some ridiculous record? He hadn't missed a minute or something like that in like two or three years, something like that. He, he just seems to keep going on and on and on with you guys. Yeah, he didn't miss a minute last season. Hmm. Um, so he was what 38, 39 last year. Yeah, uh, last season played every minute of every every league game. He didn't play any uh, Pizza Cup. Yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, Papa John's, whatever it's called. Um, but yeah, no, he just he keeps himself fit. Um, he's not lost any of his you know uh, heart, and desire, and determination to want to win. Um, he puts his body on the line week in week out. You know, I think, I think there's a picture going around on Twitter today with him uh, with a, a massive bandage around his head. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's just that kind of character. Um, he's done really well for us the last couple of years, and uh, he was head and shoulders player of the year last year. And I'd argue that probably you know, he's had a bit of a stickier time of late, but um, overall this season, I think he's again been. Definitely in the in the top three players that we've had um, over the course of the season so far, and uh, you know, Mister Reliable. Uh, we just need somebody that can partner him at the back and uh, <laughs> and a goalkeeper behind him that will uh, keep the, the the ship nice and tight. Yeah, I mean, speaking of partnering him at the back, I don't think he's done this much this season. But uh, obviously, I think the only former Carl on your team is uh, Nathaniel Knight Percival. Um, not really played much, has he? I think he's been more of a backup and he's had a few injuries as well, hasn't he, this season for you guys? Yeah, I've been very sort of in and out. Um, again, fitness is uh, probably his, his main issue, getting to the the latter end of his career. But uh, yeah, when he's come in, he's done, he's done okay. He's, he's one of those players who will either look really strong and solid or he'll mm. look like he's, you know, a bit out of his his depth and, the, you know, the, the game is maybe... A bit too quick for him, given his age. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think he's one of those that you know, on his day, he can really boss a, a centre forward and uh, you know, head and kick everything away. When it's not his day, and he's getting, you know, he's getting forced into the channels and things like that. He, you know, he looks a bit of a disaster zone, to be fair. But mm. you know, as I say, Peter Clark has been Mister Dependable. Tom Davis. It's been the main sort of centre, central defender for us this season. He's looked okay, um, really good on in parts, and and again, sort of, he's had his shaky, shaky times as well. But um, yeah, between the three of them, there's there's plenty of experience. I think we must have the oldest defence in the uh, <laughs> in the country. It must be must be well over hundred between the three of them. Um, well. Let- in terms of the, the running, I mean, it's so tight at the top of, of League Two this season, isn't it? I mean, only a handful of points between, well, basically down from second to about 10th. I mean, are you confident you can get yourselves at least a playoff place? Because I, mean, I, was, I was looking at you running before and you know, inclu- even including the game against us, take away Bristol Rovers in Exeter. It, it looks quite a kind running for you guys. You've got teams generally down near the bottom. I mean, you've got both Stevenage and Oldham to play, haven't you? 
Yeah, I mean, we we were one of the few teams to uh, get turned over at Scunthorpe, though. So <laughs> uh, that, that doesn't bode well, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, our home form is 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 excellent. Is mm. I think one of the best, if not the best, in the in the division. Um, but our away form is shocking, and I don't know why that is. Whether it's a, a mentality thing, whether it's a you know a, a style of, of football, I've not been to too many aways to be to be to be honest with you, Lee. Uh, but the ones I have seen, we've been <laughs> uh, we've not been great. Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of the, the the home fixtures we've got coming up, I would be reasonably confident that we could pick up maximum points. But away from home, it's anybody's guess. And, you know, we've not picked up many points on the road at all, um, which is a worrying sign if you want to get promoted because you do need to be, you know, you do at least need to be picking up uh, points here and there. And we haven't been doing so definitely of late. So, yeah, as you say, there's there's games that look easy on paper, but, um, you know, people will be battling for their... uh, you know, their different prizes and whatnot f- between now and the end of the season. So, yeah, I'm still hopeful. I'm still optimistic that we'll, we'll at least make the playoffs. But, um, yeah, we're, we're not making things easy for ourselves. Well, we, we certainly gifted you three points at Brunton Park uh, earlier in the season, as we did to most teams in the first half of the season, to be fair. But we're certainly a bit bit more of a test these days, I think it's fair to say. Um before we get into predictions, mate, uh, just, just a quick one about um, Prenton Park, because there's been a lot of work done around the ground, especially and stuff to do with the community of the club under the Palias uh, ownership in the last few years. Uh, some Carlisle fans will be going down there probably for the first time in maybe three or four years, actually, when I think about it. And, and things have changed there. T- tell us a little bit what, what, what they can expect, because obviously you've got things like your, your fan zone now, aren't you, where you can go for the drinks in the, in the big tent, and there's, there's work being done on that in the next couple of years, isn't there, in terms of making that even better? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um... Carl, our fans would be very welcome in the uh, in the in the tent, as it's affectionately known, <laughs> the uh, the fan park, which is literally just a tent, um, just a big marquee in the in the car park. Um, not more. It's it, it is as glam as it sounds, uh, <laughs> but it's really good, really good atmosphere in there. Really good uh, selection of beers. The uh, supporters trust. They sort of run the. Uh, um, the bar in there and um, it's very much supporter led and really helps the supporter experience because it's a lot better in there than it usually is inside the stadium watching the football. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, no, the, um, as I say, away fans are, are welcome in there. Um, you know, a really good atmosphere, friendly faces and um, good selection of beers. So yeah, um, get yourselves in there. Definitely. Um, Definitely above the uh, the local hostelries um, <laughs> around the area, which can be a little bit um, a little bit dodgy if you <laughs> if you get my drift. I've had a few decent pints in the Brenton <laughs> Park down the years when we've been. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for your time, Paul. Really appreciate. It. Before yeah, we finish, uh, have you got a prediction for this weekend's game? I've got to say, a Tranmere win. Um, <laughs> you need it, don't you? Really? Yeah, we do. We desperately need it. Um, Thankfully, result went for us uh, last night, which kept us in mm. the in the top uh, top seven. With uh, I say Mansfield dropping points after they were after they were two and up. So yeah, yeah, we need to uh, we need to keep picking up points. It's stupidly, I mean, a, a win could could take us back into the uh, you know into fourth, uh, potentially third, um, depending on other results. So it is it is that tight. You can throw away uh, you know. A, 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 a paper towel over the the you know the teams from yeah. second till tenth. So yeah, um, I'm hoping that we've we've got our uh, creativity boots on and we can create a couple of chances for the likes of Hemmings and Nevitt and whoever else might be playing in those forward positions. But yeah, I'll go for I'll go for a two 0 Carlisle have got nothing to play for, quite literally. So well, we well come we, on. We, we were out on our feet. You've got to give us this one, boys. <laughs> we were out on our feet in Rochdale, so I wouldn't be surprised if you did get the win. <laughs> Paul, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, all the best for the rest of the season. Cheers, Lee. Thanks, mate. So yeah, thanks once again to Paul for giving up his time to speak to us. Um, and just wish I'd try and all the best for the rest of the season after this weekend, of course. Um, before we get on to talking about the actual match, Dan, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of a, a promo to something uh, someone who's actually a good 
good friend of both of us, isn't he? Uh, Craig Mill is a Cal United fan uh, of many years. Uh, he lives down my way. Lives uh, on the on the wrong side of the uh, of the Mersey, unfortunately for him. But um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, Craig um, has basically been getting involved um, with some sort of like men's health walks with uh, Talk Hub and. He's done a few of these recently, and what he's done is he, he's arranged one that's going to take place on the morning of uh, this weekend's game um, for Carlisle and Tramway fans to both take part in. Basically, just to go for a walk and just have a chat and that kind of thing. It's not, nothing serious, nothing you know, you know, in depth. It's just you know, just good to get you know people out walking and talking. Um, so this is going to take place um, at eleven a.m. from the Johnny King statue right by Prenton Park. Um, they're going to walk to and around Birkenhead Park. Uh, interestingly, Birkenhead Park was said to be the model for Central Park in New York. That's an interesting fact for you. Um, and then returning back to Printing Park for 1pm to join other fans in the fan zone before the game. Um, the idea is pretty simple. It's just a, a bunch of people walk together in nice surroundings for a couple of hours and have a chat. Uh, for those who are lonely or living with mental health issues, it's a chance to meet people in a comfortable environment. For others, it's a chance to connect with other local fans, meet uh, lots of other people and support those who have challenges. So, um, yeah, for Carlisle fans who are coming from further afield, uh, the chance to meet outside Birkenhead Park School um, as well on uh, at 12 noon if, if, you, if you're not going to arrive as soon as 11am basically. Um, that's at CH434UY at 12 noon. You can park up there and basically walk down to the ground um, or you can just welcome the walkers back when they get back at 1pm at the fan zone. Um, it, yes, if you can can't... Say, I'm a bit disappointed you didn't use phonetic there. <laughs> I do apologise. I'm being, I'm, being a man, man, a man who talks a lot in it. Very yeah, disappointed in you there. Yeah, I do, I do, I do really apologise for that one, but I'm not going back and doing that again. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah. So basically, if you go on um, on on Twitter, uh, Craig's um, handle I think is one Carlisle. That's the digit one and the word Carlisle. Yeah. But also, uh, you can find the, uh, the, the the Talk Hub um, Twitter feed as well, which is Talk Hub. We'll under, uh, we'll underscore. we'll retweet it as well. Absolutely, yeah. So if you want to get along, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and get down there myself if I can't even get all my stuff sorted in Saturday morning. I'll try and pop along as well for a little bit, that at the very least. So, um, so yeah, fantastic uh, little initiative there from Craig. We said we'd give him a little plug, and there you go, Craig. That's your plug. Um, right, let's get on to the game then, Dan. Uh, Tram here, obviously, at Prenton Park this weekend, at two, uh, sorry, 3 o'clock kickoff on Saturday. Uh, referee, Charles Breakspear from Surrey. Um, it's his ninth season as an EFL referee. He's taken charge of... Right, we've made a comment about a number of cards this season for referees, haven't we? And then being quite high, but some of them were like, well, actually, it's not that high when you really think about it, is it really, with the number of games? Well, check, check this one out. He's taken charge of 31 games so far this season. He's handed out 136 yellow cards. And four That's red... Awesome. But only four red cards, and two of those red cards have been in the last three games he's took charge of. Um, I say 136 is a lot. He handed out 10 of those yellow cards the last time United got refereed by him, which was Chris Beach's last game in charge. Back at Bristol Rovers uh, in October, uh, the 3 0 defeat. Uh, six United players were booked that day. So United would have got a thousand pound fine, wouldn't they, for that? Because you get that's what you yeah, get, isn't it? If yeah. you get six yellows or more. So, so there you go. Um, that's the referee. Head to head wise, uh, 91st time we faced Tramway Rovers. A uh, little bit behind the heads to heads. Uh, we've won 35. They've won 38 and 17 have been a draw. Last season, their final position was seventh in League Two and they lost in the play of semi-finals to Morecambe. Quite surprised that, wasn't it, really? Because they looked a really strong side last season, actually, when we played them twice. But, you know, with James Vaughan in attack and I think they had David Nugent on the books for a short while as well, didn't they? Um, yeah, yeah. But they just couldn't get it over the line, could they? And, you know, that, Keith Hill got sacked just before they got to the playoffs, didn't he? Was it, it was quite a bizarre situation. They obviously weren't very happy with what he was doing there, but it, it did seem strange to do that just before those games. But but there you go. This season, again, they're in seventh place on uh, 63 points from 39 games. And do, do you know something? They always seem to be in about sixth or seventh place. When Whenever I have a look at the league, they're just always sixth or seventh. Yeah. Well, on, on always. There's, a, there's a great... Um, it's strange you say that because actually they've only been in that position I think maybe three times three or four times this season look in yeah. fact yeah look at it actually three four times this season they've been in either sixth or seventh place it's, which is bizarre isn't it really so but I, there's this great thing on this website called football web pages and it shows you all the different stats and one of them it shows you a progress chart showing where they've been up and down the table 
they spent a good, probably about 12 games in second place up until the 32nd game or 33rd game. And since then, they've just dropped off again. It's really bizarre that the, the way their form has gone up and down this season is is very strange because at that point, we were looking and thought, well, it's, it's Forest Green Rovers and Tramway going up, isn't it? And you know the rest are sort of fighting out for other positions. But clearly, something's just, just not quite right there. And I think... One of the issues they have, well, in fact, we'll touch on that in a minute, actually. Let's, let's talk about um, the manager first. Uh, so, Mickey Mellon, obviously, his manager. We've mentioned that already. But uh, he was appointed, or reappointed, we should say, uh, in May last year. Um, we don't know how long his contract length is. They, they, I don't know why clubs do this now. They don't announce how long manager contract is. Can you imagine if Carlo did that? The fans would riot. <laughs> We'd demand to know how long he's going to be our manager. Um, I mean... It created quite a buzz, didn't it, with uh, with Tranmere fans when he was reappointed last May because they, they were quite sad to see him go, didn't he? He left after the whole points per game for Argo at the end of the uh, the COVID cancelled or the COVID ended season. That's a good word. Yeah, for Argo. It's a good, good word for that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, having him back after that one season in charge of Dundee United, uh, north of the board, back in his homeland, the fans really believed, oh, this is the man who can take us up. But... He's just about managed to keep them in the playoff hunt for most of the season. But he, they've had this real drop-off in form, haven't they? And, he, and he's struggling to get them to kick on beyond that. And goal scoring does seem to be the big problem in the team. Um, and yeah, he's still got the spot of, of most of the fans, I think. But you'd imagine if they miss out on the playoffs, there might be some discussions about his job, mightn't there? Mm. Which which sounds harsh, really. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I've just got the league table up there as uh, you were talking and you know, it's, uh, take away maybe Forest Green and Exeter from Northampton to Salford. You've got seven points yeah. covering nine clubs, and any of those clubs could go up automatically. And it's a proper bun fight, isn't it? There's a weird mishmash of games in hand in there. I mean, if you want to talk about the fact that Mansfield yeah, have got yeah. games in hand, Mansfield are going to play Forest Green Rovers twice still, <laughs> which is incredible. Ooh. I didn't even realize yeah. that because of a weird post. Oh, in fact, it was that game that was called off because of fog, wasn't it? And they've actually That's right, yeah. rearranging it later in the season. And they actually play Forest Green on the last day of the season as well, I think. So it's quite a crazy one, that one. Um, but yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens towards the end of the season. I, I imagine they've probably got just enough to get themselves into the playoffs, I'd think. But, you know, we, we could put a spanner in the works on that this season, this weekend. Um, we've done them a favour in recent weeks, though. We've beaten Northampton and Bristol Rovers. They're just not taking advantage of it. Um, yeah. uh, as, as we saw last weekend... Their last game, losing 1-0 at Colchester United, it's not a good result for them, is it? Because no. Colchester, unlike us, Colchester weren't in great form going into that game and they got a 90th minute winner. Really, really poor that for, for them. Um, they only made one sub in that game as well, which is again, another strange one, that, isn't it? Uh, overall form-wise, they're actually 15th in the last six games form table. The record of loss, loss, 1-1, drawn loss. United are down to fifth. Boo, Simpson out. Um <laughs> Because we had been first for a, a couple of weeks, but um, but they or near, nearly first for a couple of weeks. But there you go. Um, quick look through their squad. Then I think we mentioned the fact that they're, they're very well packed in terms of attackers, but they, they are struggling for goals. I've got their goal scoring record in. Paul <clears throat> Glatzel is their top scorer with six goals. He hasn't he's been weak. recently either. He's, he's been injured, I think, and and, and that yeah. and you know what the fact that their top scorers on six, and you know we've got top scorers on more goals than that which is quite telling, isn't it, really? So it shows you yeah, where, where yeah. the area they're struggling. But they've got they've got good players in other areas, haven't they? The two that stand out for me are the old men, uh, which is an insult, really. <laughs> Joe Murphy and Peter Clark, both 40-year-old and producing it week in, week out, still at our level. You know, it's credit to the pair of them for me. I mean, Clark's lasting power is incredible. I mean, he's barely missed a yeah. game in the last like three or four years, isn't he? It's just in astonishing really and and I think back to the game back at Brennan Park at the start of the season and, and he was superb in that game he re- really really was he he gave our attackers no time on the ball at all and obviously you know they got a bit of a scabby win with Rob, Rob McDonald's own goal giving them the three points but you know wins a win really isn't it? That, at any point in the season really you, you'll, you'll take that Um, you obviously mentioned Clark and, and Murphy there Jay Spearing in midfield a little bit of an underrated player sometimes yeah, really? he's, he's, I'm just looking. He must have been injured because he's mm. uh, he's missed a few, and just he was on the bench for Colchester. So 
Looks yeah. like he got injured at the start of February. He was uh, subbed at half time. So. Yeah, obviously they've got Josh McPaik in attack as well. A player that we were allegedly were looking at from Rangers, weren't we? In January, yeah. they didn't, couldn't quite get a deal done. Um, Kieran Morris really impressed me, actually, for the for the game at Brunton Park. I thought he looked really good in that match. I was, I was really impressed with him. Um, Callum McManaman's not really made the impact they probably would have hoped. You know, he's only managed two goals in his uh, appearances so far for them. On the um, bench a lot now, isn't he? He just seems yeah. to... And obviously, yeah, the, the, of the of the Nathaniel Knight Percival, who's basically is a backup defender, isn't he for, for yeah, um, yeah. Tramway these days? There is another Cal United link in their team, isn't there, Dan? Is it? I'm not look- oh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> you got it. You clicked that. Kane, he- Kane Hemmings, it's son of Tony. Is it? Yeah. In, in attack, yeah. So there you go. That, that's, that's the other Cal United link. He was uh, January signing from Burton. Quite. A, a, a decent sign of that wasn't it he's only managed the four Burton goals had a big clear out didn't he yeah he's only managed four goals in 15 games so far but he's made, made another four though according to uh, yeah I think that, that's one of, got the, one of the key things I think is the fact that he's not actually been getting great supply so actually to get four goals is not a bad return I mean yeah. to be honest he, he puts him up to six or, or joint uh, fourth in their yeah. top scorers for the season which is quite telling really isn't it I suppose um, but yeah they, they, they've got a decent squad they're just maybe lacking, like you said, just a natural goal scorer in there. Someone like it, almost like a Christian Dennis, that would be perfect, wouldn't you think, when you look at it? But, uh, but there you go. Um, let's move on to talk about United then, Dan. Um, Injury-wise, obviously Derek Guy and Senior are all out for the season. Won't be seeing them again this campaign. Uh, Kieran Miller, uh, sorry, Kevin Miller, Kelvin Miller returned to <laughs> action against uh, Bristol Rovers. So he should be available. Whether he can do a full 90 is another question, but... It might be a good chance to get a good 60, 70 minutes under his belt maybe in this match. Move Riley to midfield. And then obviously later on you can you can switch it and put Riley there to fill in maybe. That would be... and I would uh, my, my two changes were would be I'd give Armour a rest and play Roberts and I would bring Mellon in and put Riley <sighs> into the middle beside Devine and Gibson probably. You're jumping ahead a bit here, Dan. I was about to, I was about to get onto that bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, but yeah... You, We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Obviously, we've got the players who are on loan still. Um, but yeah, Tory again, as I mentioned before, he, he's fit, but I mean, it doesn't look like he's going to be selected at all before the end of the season, does it? Really, he just can't no. get that ring, he can't get that ring rustiness out of him. Simmer probably doesn't rate him, to be honest. Um, there must be a decent chance of changes after that midweek game where they look so tired. I think you said it, midfield and maybe wing back is where we'd look to make the tweaks then. So, I, I, I'm with you. I think what I'd do, like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd probably bring Meller in at right wing back, move Riley into midfield, take Whelan out the team. Um, and then it's a question of left wing back. You said bring Roberts in. I, I'd maybe be half tempted to put Dickinson in there, and maybe mm. put maybe put Divine into the team. Teams, isn't there? You can bring Divine in then, and you got a little bit more of a solid two midfielders in Divine and Riley with Gibson just floating a little bit more. And uh, yeah. it's whether you maybe give Dennis another little rest and put Show Silver in from the start and bring Dennis on later on, maybe. That's the only other change. But bar that, I don't think you'd make a huge amount of changes to the team, would you, I think, for this one? Yeah. And obviously the question is, I mean, you wouldn't change your, your back three and your goalkeeper, would you, at the end of the day? No, no, play, no whatever happens. Themselves. And Patrick and Gibson are going to start whatever happens, I think. So, yeah, yeah just maybe the, the rest, maybe you look at maybe making a few tweaks. Um, okay, then, uh, let's have... Um, Match predictions then, Dan. What are you going to go for for this game? Uh, one all. One all. Who are you going to go for? One score? all. Joe Riley's dual goal. Joe Riley to get a goal. You think back in midfield, driving runner, yeah. smash run on the back of the net. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think we might. Uh, well, I suppose we haven't drawn yet under Simpson, have we? You just you were just saying that. Obviously, we've won and we've, we've drawn. To... That was part of my thinking. Mm. Maybe I'll go for a draw. Or do- I'm going to go for a 2-2 draw then. I'll go for a 2-2 draw with goals. A Desmond. A Desmond 2-2 and I'll go for goals from... Uh, Simi is finally going to get his goal. It's going to be the last <laughs> minute uh, injury time equaliser. And the other goal will be Christian Dennis back on the sh- score sheet. I think he'll get another one. Um, right, let's have Mike's predictions. So I'm going to back a 1-0 win with uh, the big show, show silver getting our goal with a last minute winner Ooh, there we go big Toby getting Ooh. the winner in the last minute that could cause some scenes that couldn't it 
Can you imagine? Mm. Simi will be swimming in the Mersey probably if he did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hanging off the floodlights. And... Yeah. Ooh. God knows. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I just realised we didn't ask Mike's question at the halftime break, so we'll do it now before we do the X-Files section, Dan. Uh, here's Mike's question for this week. In fact, yeah, this is Mike's question. Blues legend Kevin Gray was cruelly voted Tramir Rovers' worst ever player in a poll by their supporters. Now, in 1997, after a pretty standard Cav Grey tackle, Gordon Watson of Bradford City suffered a broken leg. Two years later, he sued Cav Grey for damages. How much was he paid in compensation? That's a cheery uh, question, isn't it? <laughs> <It's a laughs> yeah. I think I know the answer is, I think it's 1.2 million. That, that's what rings a bell. I, I think. think it's around the million mark, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go million mark two. sounds. So yeah. you're, going, you're going a million, I'll go 1.2. Well, yeah. ra- rather than wait on this one, because it's a fairly simple, let's, let's just get the answer, shall we? So here's what the answer to that question. And it was £909,143. <laughs> It's off, Mike. Oh, we're going to do the exact yeah. figure like that. You're taking the piss. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, so we were both wrong, basically, on that one. So if anyone got that right, g- give yourself a pat on the back or yeah. a-, a bollocking for Googling it and finding out. Um, right, x file section done. Not as busy this week in terms of goals and that kind of thing, but a bit of a international and coaching appointments. Yeah, uh, weekend... Uh... Ashley Addison scored for Crawley in the 1-0 win over Rochdale. Uh, Jamie Proctor scored a stunning De Canio-esque Kung Fu volley if for you, Port Vale in the 2-0 win over Sutton. If you've not seen this, go and search it out because it is a terrific yeah. goal, isn't it? It just sits up nicely. He's like, ah, you know what? You don't get a chance to do this very often. He just has a go, doesn't he? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Byron Webster scored for Bromley in the one all draw at Wealdstone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stefan Skugel scored a penalty in Alloa's 3-0 win at East Fife mm. and Peter Grant got a red card in Queen's Park's 1-0 win over Clive you don't, don't get to mention uh, Peter Grant very often do we? <laughs> that's no, a rarity because he's not very good that's why yeah. <laughs> uh, midweek there was nothing uh, but there wasn't many games yeah. but the other we said we'd find internationals we did mm. Uh, Kevin Wright was an unused substitute for Sierra Leone in a 3-0 defeat to Togo. Uh, James Brown was an unused sub for Malta in their first game. Uh, Alex McQueen played for Grenada, Grenada sorry, against Gibraltar and Andorra. Uh, he actually got subbed a minute after the... Was it Andorra or the Gibraltar game? I can't remember. Uh, I think it was the Andorra game, wasn't it? Because they lost Andorra that scored, and then McQueen got subbed like 30 seconds later, which suggests he may have uh, caused a goal. <laughs> uh, youngster James Trafford at Man City featured for England 20s in a good win over Germany. A uh, bit of management type news. Uh, Andy Welsh, who's now manager at AFC Berry, led them to the Northwest Counties Division 1 North title. Uh, they would have been well ahead in that league all season. Uh, and a couple of more exotic ones. Adam Murray is now assistant coach at Besiktas. Uh, Valerie and Ishmael, who he worked <laughs> with at uh, Barnsley and West Brom, has gone there, so he's followed him. And Zigar Araldi is assistant coach at Qatari side Al Sad Sports Club alongside his uh, long-time colleague, Javi Gracia. Yeah, interesting ones there. I've just double checked there the England C thing. Aaron Hayden didn't feature in the end, so I'm not sure. No, he no, left no. Maybe at the last minute because he was he was called no, up as a England was C squad. Yeah, there was there was only sixteen players on the England sheet. So. Uh, so there you go. So maybe he must have picked up a knock or something like that because you'd imagine he would have been starting if he was fit, wouldn't you? Yeah. But, but there you go. Um, that's it then, Dan, isn't it? I think that's uh, this week's episode rounded up. Um, Thanks once again for joining me. Thanks once again to everyone for listening and for the London Banks for supporting us uh, this season. Um, in terms of upcoming episodes, next week's going to be a little bit different. You're going to get your episode a little bit earlier because you're on a holiday, Dan, aren't you? You're in a... Uh, where are you going to for your for your holly bobs next week? Turkey. Turkey, very nice. I've seen the weather looks good out yeah. there, doesn't it, for next week? Yeah. I'm I'm flying out to Berlin for the Berlin Derby on the Friday, so I'm missing the Exeter game. 
Um, so rather than put it out on the Friday morning and then while I'm on a flight finding out there's something wrong with it, <laughs> we're not taking any risks. Me and Mike are going to record on Sunday, uh, a, little, a lot earlier than usual because that's the only time Mike was available. Uh, we'll put the episode out on Tuesday, Wednesday. I'll work out exactly when nearer the time. Um, and yeah, you'll get your episode nice and early. And then Mike's going to be at the game. He'll be the one rounding it up for us, basically telling us what happened in the exit of the game. Because both, I think, are you back in time for the exit of the game or are you missing it? No, I don't fly back till that evening. So oh, I miss well, there you it. go. So Mike is the one who's going to be telling us what happened in the exit of the game. I might try and watch it myself when I'm outside the Olympic Stadium uh, chewing on some uh, lovely bratwurst. Uh, that's not a eu- euphemism, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's that's the plans for next week's episode. And obviously, coming up very soon, we've got the 100th uh, special, haven't we, Dan? Yeah. What we're we going to do with that, we don't know. We had, a, we had a nice little chat with John Coleman the other day about it as well. He had a little chat with us about the podcast. So keep an eye out for that in the News and Star the week before the Harrogate game. Because that'll be out then, won't it? Yeah. I hope so. Right, Dan, I'll let you go on with your day. Uh, I'll let everyone else get on with the day as well because I think we've rabbited on for long enough, haven't we, this week? Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, if you're making the journey down this weekend, have a safe journey down. The, the trains aren't running either, Dan, I don't think, between Preston and Warrington or something, so you, you struggle to get down on the train if you're going that way, so uh, good luck to you if that's your option. Um, but yeah, have a safe journey down and up the blues. Up the blues.